happy to introduce uh, Alana LeBlanc, who is the critical care CNS at Vancouver General Hospital. She has the portfolio of both ICU and the high acuity um, unit. And she's here to talk to us today on patient center rehabilitation in the ICU. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me to talk about rehab planning in the ICU. This is, um, you can think of this as a QI report. Um, I have, you know, big dreams of turning this into a research study at some point. You know, I think like a lot of uh, quality improvement projects, this is a, an issue, um, the sort of problem, which I'll share later, um, is something that's been a concern for me as a critical care nurse for my entire career. I found it sometimes quite frustrating and, and difficult that there, there was some lack of consistency, particularly for patients in the ICU who had prolonged stay, um, who had complex rehabilitation needs, and that sometimes we didn't communicate that well as a team. And what that can lead to is uh, missed opportunities for progressing the patient's care missed opportunities to engage patients and families. And I always thought that was just too bad because we do some great work in the Vancouver General ICU. And, you know, uh, addressing the rehabilitation needs for patients in an intensive care unit is a complicated thing. We all need to be kind of pulling in the same direction. Um, and so we need to be able to talk to each other. So, and you can imagine that in the busy environment of VGH ICU and the high acuity uh, of that we have there, it sometimes doesn't get stay top of mind when <clears throat> there's someone else next door who's really hemodynamically unstable. Or so all of that emergency that's happening around these patients, I think can be somewhat distracting. So that's kind of where I was at. Um, and so I decided to pull together a few people to, um, uh, to, to work on a quality improvement project. And so we engaged our stakeholders and we went through a very standard QI PDSA kind of process. And that's what I'm going to explain to you guys now. Um, so uh, for those of you who don't work in intensive care units, early rehabilitation or early mobilization is a big thing. Um, it is something that is hard to do, but very beneficial for patients. It's been shown to be safe and feasible in an ICU environment. Uh, benefits to the patients include decreased days of delirium, uh, decreased mechanical ventilation or days on mechanical ventilation, decreased ICU acquired weakness, uh, improved functional long-term functional outcomes, um, and reduced ICU and hospital length of stay. So all of the images in this presentation, I've either pulled off the internet or from, uh, some of them are our images and some of them aren't, but they're all been published in one way or another. Um, so this is an image I pulled off one, uh, a, a, a ICU in the United States. You can see this is a patient who is walking and the ventilator is walking next to him. Um, and then similarly in the next, there's actually a, you can see a, a personnel bagging the patient. Um, on the patient's right-hand side, and they're walking him down the hall. One person has the, there's three people that are helping this person walk down the hall. So not everybody who mobilizes in the ICU mobilizes by walking. Uh, sometimes we use a cycle ergometer for patients who can't, uh, either don't have the strength or some technology prevents them from getting out of bed. Um, but uh, typically this is the kind of thing we're aiming for. Um, there are many patients in the ICU who can only do exercises in bed. In any case, in our ICU, we have physiotherapy coverage. Um, we also have occupational therapy, although probably less than we need, in my view. Um, and so in collaboration with the nurses, the respiratory therapists, the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, we need to come up with a rehab plan for each patient. Not every patient actively engages in rehabilitation. Some of them are too unstable or some are too sick. Many of them in our ICU are not cognitively able to engage, whether that's because they're getting some sedative medications or because their cognitive status isn't sufficient to actually engage in rehabilitation. And which means that you're actively participating in, in physiotherapy, you can follow direction. Um, for patients who can't cognitively engage, we still mobilize them. We may lift them to a chair, for example. 
that uh, that helps with their it still helps and benefits them in similar ways to what we describe um, in these ways. But it's not as comprehensive as what we would think of as rehabilitation. So I want you guys to think about a difference between physiotherapy and mobilization. One is therapeutic and the patient is involved. And this might be perfectly obvious to everybody else on the call, but I'm telling you for critical care people, this was mind blowing. Um, therapy is patients involved, mobilization is passive. So I see some people nodding and laughing at me, but you know, it's a learning curve. It's a learning curve for everybody. Uh, so in VGHICU, we've been invested in um, mobilizing our patients for a long time. Uh, we won a BC Quality Award in 2015, and we actually implemented early mobilization, a pathway, um, a couple years before that. So um, this is something that's been long on my mind, and we've had a multidisciplinary comprehensive approach up until this point. So what was our problem? So I've talked a little bit about this so far. So mobilization and physiotherapy for those patients who can do it is routinely addressed in VGH ICU, but coordination between particularly respiratory therapy and physiotherapy was lacking. And one of the reasons for that, and we learned this retroactively after we started doing this project, was that physiotherapists and respiratory therapists were rarely in the same place at the same time to discuss how to balance the needs of ventilate, ventilator weeding, so like breathing practice, or uh, versus um, like physiotherapy, so other kinds of strength training. Um, and so we were sometimes working on cro at cross purposes for those patients who were essentially failing to progress for one reason or another. Um, so we were missing some coordination. We were missing co uh, continuity. So as the nurse coming to the bedside, I didn't necessarily know what was done yesterday that wasn't well communicated. I didn't know what the plan was to, to do today. And so as the nurse at the bedside, I would come at 7 or 7.30, I would write out my to-do list, but I actually had to wait for a physiotherapist to breeze by me or a respiratory therapist to breeze by me at some point and say, hey, we're going to do a uh, CPAP trial starting at 11, or hey, we're going to mobilize this patient at 1. And so we had tried various ways to try to get that information like on a Cardex or on a sign or whatever, and we really just never really got good at it. And so this project for these selected patients uh, has really helped with that continuity piece because the patients are involved, families are involved, clinicians are involved, and we've made it much more obvious. Um, and we felt that this coordination piece was most important for our long stay patients um, so that we can progress them and they don't have any kind of failure or tiring in their physiotherapy and their respiratory therapy goals. But also uh, for those patients, and Vinny will be well aware of this, uh, for those patients um, who are weaning from a ventilation ventilator and who are very anxious, we really felt that that ability to predict day to day what you're going to be doing could assist with anxiety um, and in some ways assist with what we can sort of call motivation. Although I, I, I struggle to call, I, I, I have the difficulty, difficulty with saying somebody is not motivated um, because I think the patients themselves are more motivated than any of us to to get out of the ICU, um, and if they're not if they're not coming across as motivated, then we're probably missing some other piece of either pain or anxiety or um, hopelessness or something like that. Um, so obviously, we wanted to target the longest stay patient, and um, we had never really been serious about trying to engage patient and families um, systematically. Um, about their rehab preferences, uh, their rehab goals, and their rehab needs. So that has changed quite a bit in how we address those patients who are on a rehab plan. We meet with them as a group with RT, respiratory therapy, nursing, uh, uh, MD, occupational therapy as needed, recreation therapy, if we have uh, that for some patients, and actually talk about their goals and their preferences. So goals, for example, I'd like to get outside. I really wanna focus on standing. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So then we can get that uh, progressive mode. All of this is very normal for rehab settings. It is not normal for critical care. So this was our aim. In December 2021, we started our formal quality improvement project. And this was our aim. By June 2022, we will implement interprofessional rehab planning for selected patients with complex rehabilitation needs in VGH ICU. And I'm delighted to tell you we were successful in this aim. Um, it was honestly the first rehab, first QI, pro I've done a bunch of QI projects over the years. This is the first time I was actually ever on time. So yay us. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I know you guys understand how difficult that is. 
Uh, so we were really, we're really happy with how, how things have gone along. Uh, so what is, what are we talking about here? Um, so it's really simple. Here's an example of a rehab plan for a patient. This is a week long plan. Some people have daily plans. Um, so this, this plan started on Tuesday. So Tuesday, we did a breathing trial of, the, I know there's some jargon on here, an OptiFlow trial of three hours times two. So a total of six hours of independent breathing off the ventilator for this patient. That was all the exercise this person was doing that day. The next day on Wednesday, no breathing exercise, just physical exercise. And that day, was, that was going to be stand and pivot to a chair at least once, and then overhead lift back to the chair back to the bed. So this patient was very, very anxious. And what, what, what was happening is we were asking them to breathe independently off the ventilator, which is a strange and difficult sensation. And we were mobilizing them at the same time. And they were not able to do both of the things. And they were very, very anxious. And we said, okay, we think you can do both of these things, but if it's making you feel panicked, that's not helping you. Why don't we try decoupling these things for a few days? We'll see how that goes. And we decided to do it for a week and then reassess on Monday, as you can see. So this is a way to engage the patient, acknowledge that they're feeling panic and fear, um, and still give uh, the reassurance that they're making progress towards their goals. Now, I don't have a goal written on here. We often do put the goal at the bottom, um, and I don't recall what it was for this person. So um, we meet, the core team meets once a week, and we sort of review all the patients, and then we make sure that everybody has an up-to-date um, rehab plan. Uh, and it's posted on the wall. And so my instruction to the nurses, and I literally say this a couple times a week, I'll say, instruction to the nurse is, your patient has a rehab plan, they've got a pink sign on the door, they have this on the wall, look at this paper. If you can do that, do that. If you can't do that, sometimes you can't do that. And so it took away this feeling, the nurses initially had this feeling that they were solely responsible to make sure that this all happened. I'm like, no, no, you're not solely responsible to make sure it happens because all the other, the respiratory therapists, the physiotherapists, the occupational therapists, they all know what they need to do. We're just trying to bring everybody together on the same page. And if at all possible, if you're planned to get the patient up at 11 and that's what's on the patient's rehab plan, don't plan your bath then right? Plan it later. Talk to the patient, see if they want to get washed earlier. And we have had those, some patients involve, uh, the plans involve ADLs if they have preferences, for example. Uh, we have multidisciplinary, uh, for each patient, we try to have multidisciplinary team meetings, either, well, we originally thought of every week, it's more likely every two to three weeks. And that's something that uh, in our sustainment phase, we want to get better and more predictable at. So what that looks like is a, a, a rehab focused huddle. It's not a repeat of rounds. We've already done rounds. A rehab focused huddle with all of the players, including the patient and the family when able. And we focus on the patient's rehab needs. How are we gonna get you out of here? What's important to you? What's working, what's not working? Anybody can facilitate it. We've had great buy-in. Um, and because this is a small number of patients, a fair amount of, of focused effort, but it's a small number of patients and we see the benefits. And so we haven't had too much difficulty getting this done. Um, and this is the piece that my nerdy brain really loves. Uh, we are also including baseline and functional progress monitoring. So we do a baseline clinical frailty scale, uh, which is most many of you are familiar with, no doubt, which is a nine point scale. Um, and I think nine is the worst, right? Somebody nod? Yeah, nine is the worst. One is normal. I'm a one. Um, and, the, uh, and then progress monitoring using the Chelsea Critical Care Physical Assessment. This is a specialized assessment intended for critical care patients. It is scored by the physiotherapist once per week, and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, and then another really interesting part of this project is that we decided we wanted to get the patient experience. And so we have partnered with the Vancouver Coastal Health Patient Experience Department to do follow-up interviews about the experience of being in an ICU and doing a rehab, um, doing rehab in an ICU setting. Um, and so we had initially tried to get 10 interviews. We we're having difficulty getting all of those like post-ICU patients. And I'll explain, I'll give you guys the data on what, like who is included in this program. Really complicated group. So they can be hard to follow up with. 
Um, so we've done four so far. I'm really happy that we've done four. We're going to target five and then we're going to do some preliminary analysis and see if that's all right. Uh, but the intention, again, is a QI project, not a research study. Research study comes later. Um, we want to learn some things that we can share back with our team and make our program better. Why are we doing this? I think this is probably pretty obvious to this group. We want to engage patients and families. We want to improve coordination, continuity, and communication. We want to balance the care needs between respiratory therapy and physiotherapy. Uh, and we want to be able to monitor progress, which is something we were not doing objectively before. That's the Chelsea Critical Care Physical Assessment Scale. Uh, who are we doing this with? Um, we are looking at patients who have long length of stay. So anyone with a length of stay uh, longer than seven days who we expect to stay an additional seven days can be considered. For context, uh, we have a average four to five day length of stay in our intensive care unit. And um, if you guys aren't familiar with VGH ICUs, mixed med surge, trauma, um, uh, burns, what else, spine, uh, transplant, there's a lot of uh, huge variety in our patient population. So there's a huge variety in our patient length of stay as well, but average length of stay is about four or five days. Um, the patients need to be cognitively able to engage in rehab and planning. They don't have to be perfect, but they need to be able to express a preference or two. And they need to have complex rehab needs. So even if you're a long stay patient, but you're kind of progressing without any particular difficulty, that's not the people we're targeting as the priority. Um, and so typically on a day-to-day -day basis, like today, out of the 36 patients that are in the ICU today, I have two patients on a rehab schedule. We screen the entire census every um, week to see who is, um, who is suitable to start on an active rehabilitation schedule. Um, and the main limiting factor is actually their ability to cognitively engage. Um, so we'll consider people in a shorter length of stay if we identify um, uh, complex rehab needs. Um, or if we're running into a specific problem. Um, so we're not, these aren't hard and fast rules, but the main reason that people are not able to do it is because they're actually just, they have decreased level of consciousness. Um, this is a picture of Willie Dalligan, who is a, uh, he's somebody who's been in the news. Um, he's a former ICU patient. We didn't have this program when he was uh, a patient in our ICU. He's a lung transplant recipient, was on ECMO prior to and after uh, his lung transplant. We would have done all of the rehab stuff with him in the ICU, um, but we wouldn't have had the ability to coordinate it as well. And so I just give, I just think it's nice to see pictures of, of people who've come through. And this is him like the following Christmas or something like that. This is the clinical frailty score. Like I said, uh, it's a nine point scale and it goes from very fit to terminally ill. Most of our, I, I have some data on this. Our patients range from about a one to a, well, one to seven. So pretty, pretty huge wide range. So seven is living with severe frailty. Um, and they get a baseline score and the intention is to capture it just before um, they were admitted to the, uh, the, the ICU or, or this hospital admissions, that kind of thing. We haven't been super strict about it. This is the Chelsea Critical Care Physical Assessment Scale. I can send any of this to anybody who's interested. So, cause I know it's super hard to see. Um, I think what's important for this is that it's intended to be a repeated measure um, over time. It's not an everyday kind of measure. We're doing it on a weekly basis. There are 10 domains. There are two respiratory indicators and eight non-respiratory, so including grip strength, which we got a dynamometer, a hand, hand grip dynamometer to assess that. Um, most things are sitting balance, um, that kind of stuff. So things that are basically fairly easy to measure by the physiotherapist at the bedside. Um, and we want to use it to measure people's progress and give us an objective tracker, which we never had before. It's also very, very helpful for communicating with physicians um, because it has that objectivity piece um, and it generates a lot of good discussion. Uh, this was our project timeline. Um, so we, we did a project over the year on our, um, uh, we actually went lot, kind of went live with this in May and then we hit our goal by um, June or July or whatever that slide said. Um, and there you'll see on the bottom, there are a couple of things that remain that are remain outstanding. Uh, so we weren't completely successful in our um, in completing the entire project. There were some delays in getting the data from the patients. So that slowed us down. Um, and then we want to do a more comprehensive uh, evaluation, which wasn't included here, but we want to get some more structured feedback from staff. Uh, we've had uh, anecdotal, very positive feedback, but I want to get it down on paper. 
So what have we done? So this is my data up until Jan until November, sorry. Um, and there's it hasn't changed a lot. We actually had this whole gap in December where there were hardly any patients. Uh, there's acuity in the ICU was really, really high. And there were like, I think we had one person all of December who was even capable of being involved in a rehab schedule. So up until November, 2022, we had 36 patients um, who received a rehab plan at that, sorry, I didn't update this slide. At that point, it was two current inpatients. Um, we've had more than 25 multidisciplinary rehab huddles at the bedside with the patient and frequently with the family. Um, the ICU census is uh, screened each week and all eligible patients have been enrolled since July, 2022. Um, we've had at that time more than 80 CPACs assessments uh, were completed by the physiotherapist. And at that time we had three follow-up interviews completed. We've had four follow-up interviews completed. And my hope is that the um, fifth and final uh, follow-up interview will be completed tomorrow by uh, a member of the patient experience team. These are the patients. We have an average age of 57 years. For some reason, we have way more men than women. I can't explain that. Uh, 24 men, 12 women. The baseline frailty ranged between one and seven on the clinical frailty scale. So as I said, huge, huge range. Average length of stay. So remember I said that our overall average length of stay is four to five days. Average length of stay in this group is 38 days. Um, so like orders of magnitude outside of our regular routine patient group here. And what this says to me is that we're targeting the right people. <laughs> Um, so the range of their uh, length of stay was 16 to 122 days was the longest. Five of these patients were readmitted. Um, nine patients of these, uh, nine patients died uh, during their, uh, either in the ICU or outside of the ICU during their hospital stay. Um, the time to rehab plan for the first 18 patients that I had that data on um, ranged from the first, within five days to 47 days out. And um, the average time in that group of 18 patients was 21 days, so around three weeks. Um, six of those patients were supported at some point during their stay on ECMO. And 13 out of those uh, 36 patients were lung transplant recipients. Uh, for those of you who spent any time in VGH ICU, you will know that our lung transplant population is extremely complicated. Uh, they often do have length of stay. They have prolonged uh, uh, prolonged ventilation and delayed weaning from the ventilator. So it's not too surprising that this group is um, uh, like sort of uh, represents a big piece of it. Um, and happily, we've actually been able to, with this data, we've been able to tap into a recreation therapist who helps with the lung transplant population on the 12th floor. And she's started to consult on uh, patients in the ICU. Um, and then there were three patients who were under consideration for lung transplant, but didn't receive. And two of those patients just uh, died. I'm going to pause here before I start talking about the CPACs. Any questions? Hi. Um, there are a few questions I have. And, and one of them is the, the lung transplants, because I'm working in respiratory rehab right now as well. So we've got ones waiting and they're on our um, activation programs to keep them as uh, fit as possible when going into um, to surgery, but we don't get anything back in terms of they end up coming back to us, but it would be really wonderful if we knew there was a way to communicate back that uh, the types of rehab that um, would also help on an ongoing base. So that that's one thing. It's just, it's more of a comment. Um, so I think I'd need to know, understand more about your practice area, but I wonder if it would be worth it for us to have a conversation about how to connect the right people to the right people, whether that's you and I, or whether or not it's a physiotherapist or some other uh, rehab specialist that we might be able to do, because I'm more than happy to make connections. Um, to try to get some wraparound um, continuity. Right. That's great. The other thing is that um, the transition out of ICU to um, other units, um, how well does that transition go in terms of ongoing rehab? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we haven't included the transition into our QI project, but it's something that I would want to look at more strategically um, as we grow this program. And I would like to look at it, particularly in the lung transplant population. In, the, in our current state, our physiotherapists and occupational therapists provide a summary and or a verbal handover to the occupational therapist and physiotherapist on the transplant unit on, in Tower 12 in VGH. Beyond that, I don't know. Um, so I'm going to take a minute to talk about the Chelsea uh, Critical Care Physical Assessment Scale. So this is what it looks like if on the, on the left-hand side of your screen. Uh, on the left-hand side, there's um, there's a patient who's been scored. Yeah, so there's a patient who's been scored four times. And so this is what it looks like. So the first score and then the dates are on the bottom. So this patient has progressed in various domains um, over um, a week, week to week. Um, and I prepare these graphs, uh, the, the, phys the physiotherapist document their assessment um, and they just let me know when they've done one. And then I just fire off a graph and stick it up at the side um, next to the patient's sign. Uh, and then I often go through this, this graph with patients and their families. And I've been pleasantly surprised at how interested and engaged the patients are when I go through. They're really interested in knowing what we're tracking. I've had people take pictures of it and send it to their partner on their phone and stuff. So it's actually a really good thing to generate conversation. Um, it's interesting, the morphology, I'm starting to notice patterns in these, in these spider graphs. Um, and so I see on the right-hand side of the screen is a patient who, who deteriorated and this person ended up dying. And what I'm noticing is that you see this, and this is so, kind of self-evident, but it's kind of nice to be able to actually see it within a, at a glance that, you know, when you see this bigger, bigger, bigger in a fairly smooth kind of pattern, like ripples, then that's somebody who's like improving um, and doing pretty well. And that's very reassuring to see. When I see somebody kind of, and their CPACs is starting to look like a nest or like a scribble, then that makes me worried that that person actually isn't gonna survive. Um, and now it's not diagnostics, totally my impression. And it's, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, put any particular um, diagnostic emphasis on it, but I do, I have had the conversation with, some of the physician teams and whatnot and say, listen, this person is losing ground and I'm very worried about them and maybe we should rethink, you know, is there something we're missing here? Um, I did a few, a little bit of analysis on the patients that I had full data on. It took us a while to get into the routine of actually collecting all this data. Um, so I was just kind of curious for our patients. This is for 13 patients. Um, on the left-hand side is basically the average improvement. So you can see most of the time, the, the orange line on the outside is, um, is the uh, the last one they had. Most of our patients have like three or four, oh, I'm putting my own hand up. Um, most of the patients have like two to four assessments. Um, so you can see they don't get too far on this whole scale before they get out of the ICU. They're still pretty sick when they're, when they're going out of the ICU. Um, and then the one on the right-hand side, I decided to standardize it to a two week um, uh, interval. And they, I just look kind of similar because most patients only get like, like I say, two to four um, assessments anyway. So the good news is most people are getting better. Uh, this is what it looks like when uh, you compare survivors to non-survivors. So obviously survivors are continually progressing. It looks like the first graph, I just pulled out the 10 survivors. There were three non-survivors and you can see that the, uh, they fall back in the respiratory function category, which again, makes objective sense. If you can't breathe, you're not going to survive. This is what uh, a bedside multidisciplinary team meeting looks like. Uh, so this is physician, myself, a respiratory therapy educator, bedside nurse. Uh, there's also a physiotherapist there who's not in the frame and then a, um, a nurse educator. So, and we were speaking with the patient and you can see the respiratory therapy educator is explaining, is discussing the, the, the plan with the patient. You can see that plan is very detailed. We don't make them detailed like that anymore. So this, we've learned something since then that that's, you know, it's possible to over explain things, but this was fairly early. Um, we have had from the first patient experience interview, our patient experience department um, did prepare a poster for us just to sort of get some early initial feedback. Um, we got a nine out of 10, so that was nice. 
Um, some interesting change ideas. I know this is very busy. Um, uh, basically the, the patients, this was a very long stay patient. And she basically said, you know, you could have started sooner, which is true because she was admitted before we even started our program. Um, she told us we should introduce ourselves and explain what we're doing and why, which is also true. Um, starting bed exercises sooner. But the, one of the nice things about it was, um, she said that knowing her rehab schedule was important to her and, um, she was, uh, you know, getting getting introduced and getting onto this rehab schedule planning was helpful, and she found that valuable, and she thought it would be valuable to most other people. Uh, so this is the kind of information that I want to share back with our team. So what are the next what are the next steps for us? Uh, like I said, we struggle to get consistent patient family involvement, not because the patients and families are not available, but because we as a team, as we were gaining our skills and knowledge around this process, we felt we needed to be very reliable before we started opening it up. And so we've gotten to a place now where we feel we're quite reliable. We communicate well. Uh, there aren't a lot of questions about, um, you know, if there's a schedule there, most people are familiar with, they're like, okay, that's cool. Um, and so, uh, so we're going to get strategic about inviting uh, patients and families to participate more regularly. And I'm going to be tracking that. And what I'd like to do it, I'd like to do it is up to every week if I could make it. If probably the first milestone will be reliably every two weeks. Um, we want to continue our patient experience interviews. We're going to qualitatively theme that share the feedback with staff, share the results with staff, and then build sustainability. And that's me. Wow, thank you so much. This is incredible work. So uh, I'm going to open it up for questions. So um, I guess what I heard you say, like getting the team together was um, some of your bigger challenges. What, what would be some recommendations for other people trying to do this kind of work in organizing and getting a well-functioning team? Yeah, I think, you know, honestly, it, we, we went through some several PDSAs around getting the team together and what works. Um, so importantly, everyone on the team from physicians to bedside nurses, to leadership, to allied health, everyone recognized the value of this. So we didn't have to overcome reluctance or people feeling as though this wasn't important work. So at the outset, we uh, introduced it to our stakeholders and we went through all of those processes. So no one was surprised. Um, and we've had incredible support from our team. So starting off with a great team is a great start. Um, after that, everybody's really busy. So it actually like, it like on like my advice is like clear the half hour before you want to have your meeting and then just run around and chase people down there didn't seem to be any other way to do it in an intensive care environment where people will, are pulled in every direction be very flexible respectful of people's time but to me as soon as you make a commitment to the patient or the family you follow through with whoever is there even if it's just you and to be honest that never happened um, so sometimes one or two people would drop off, but that's okay. We'll just, we got their feedback. They shared it with us on the chat. And then we just share what we know at the time and be transparent that this person wasn't able to join. Um, but yeah, so to me, it was most important that when we make a commitment to patient and family, we respect that commitment. We follow through. Even we, we changed tack on a patient who we had planned a rehab meeting um, and we had arranged for virtual participation. So we actually set up a, a Zoom meeting with various family members. And then the patient took a bad turn overnight and we ended up having an end of life care meeting. Mm. Sherry, I, I saw your hand go up next. Thanks, Alana. Um, first of all, thank you. I mean, it, it's so appreciative of being able to kind of see the window into this because I, I don't work in ICU. I mean, I've traipsed through there on occasion, but I'm certainly not living that experience. So yeah, I really appreciate this lens. So um, I'm wondering about the utility of the Rockwood clinical frailty scale when you're doing, it looks like you're just doing that in the pre-hospitalization phase. So is that just to kind of inform where your goal is, where you're kind of working towards in the limitations of that? Yeah, I think we think of it as a, I think of it as a, um, 
like a baseline assessment, almost like a descriptor, the way I would, um, because for me, it's part of the patient history, right? Yeah. So, you know, this is a person who is a baseline frailty scale of four and they have diabetes and they have whatever, and they've been admitted with necrotizing pneumonia. Um, it does facilitate the discussions about what we can reasonably expect in terms of progression. Um, and that piece of information, again, is probably really, really common in most people's practice areas. But I can tell you that in intensive care, for when somebody is just flat on their back and they're hemodynamically unstable, we don't ask people if they have trouble getting around their house. So putting that as part of the physical assessment um, with the physiotherapist allows us to get it into the chart more reliably so that we can appreciate that, com that part of the complexity of the patient's presentation. Right. So like the 48.6 and those previous documentations, that's your finding are still quite inconsistent and really difficult to kind of access, right? Yeah, we don't do 48.6 in the ICU at all. Okay. Um, and if it is documented, I frankly don't know where. <laughs> <laughs> We, we have a hard time getting it documented anyway. So yeah, that was a few years ago mandate, right? Yeah. yeah. And there was, I know that it was, it took off in the hospitalist service here and most of our patients don't come from the hospital service, hospitalist service. I don't think it was well up. I don't think there was good uptake in the CTU, which is like about a third. And then there's like another third that come through emerge and then right. like the rest of them come through the OR. So it's oh, awesome. okay. yeah. yeah. So like, if you think about whether or not we would even they would even have exposure to that kind of that kind of detailed assessment is it's not a not a ton of our patients. Oh, sorry, I was mute. Yeah, great work. I have a few questions. One, if it's okay, one is uh, just to continue to Cheryl's question of the raw foot uh, uh, frailty scale, which is mostly used in geriatric patient population, and um, looking at how many uh, lung transplant patients you have, so they would not be in that frailty category. So I'm kind of like, I'm curious, how was that frailty score uh, choose at the beginning? That, that's one question. And the other question is, um, I'm, I'm curious why it's so difficult to get uh, um, a response from patient for the, their experiences. Is it because they passed or um, maybe is the patient a family that could maybe provide some? Did you think about having a patient family experiences uh, added to if the patient by themselves are not available? Yeah, that's a, those are great questions. So uh, with regard to the clinical frailty scale, um, we liked this one, we've seen it. And so we thought we would use it. That's about as much thought as went into it. Um, so there might be a more suitable uh, tool. And if you think we should be using a different one, I'm open to suggestions. Um, but this one was, yeah, it's, it, we know that it's typically a geriatric scale, but we still felt that it had some utility in describing the patient's baseline level of functioning. Um, and up until this project, we hadn't been doing any frailty scale, uh, every, any frailty scoring at all. So this was something more than what we had. Um, with regard to the follow-up, um, so as you can see, this is a really, uh, really complex, medically complex and diverse group of patients. So I've sent uh, around uh, inform like the contact information for roughly 30 patients to our patient experience department. Um, and only nine of those people died and I didn't send any of their contact details because I, well, I don't, I checked to make sure the patient's still alive before I send the contact details. Um, and so, um, there's various reasons why people are having a hard, our patient experience department's having difficulty is actually discussing it today. One of the main reasons is that these people remain frail and complicated. And so if they agree to you, we finally get in contact with them and you set up a time for a meeting two weeks later, by the time the meeting rolls around two weeks later, sometimes they've been readmitted to the hospital or they're having some additional medical problem that makes this not a priority for them. Um, I, think that, uh, I think that our going forward, if I was to put the, turn this into a research study, I would do a much more formal consenting process and I would probably do follow-up at six months to a year where we're looking at six weeks to three months. Um, so if we 
talk to people outside of three months, then that's fine. But we're starting to contact people probably too early. And I think that's our, that's our gap. Uh, however, we have managed to get four out of five. So we're gonna see what we can get with that five. Uh, with regard to patients' families, um, when we contact people, we would like, we've targeted the patient because they're the, we really wanna get their personal experience. But if the patient chooses to include a family member and just about everybody has, we're happy to interview them together. Um, in those patients that you are working with, that you've worked with, um, was there any communication from a language perspective? that you um, were challenged with? And if so, how did you get around it? Yeah, that's a great question. So it so happens that even those patients who had um, English as a second language um, were all able to communicate well enough for us to get by. Um, however, routinely we use um, a virtual interpreter service here with our physiotherapy department. So if we needed, um, if we needed to, for the the yeah if we needed a virtual interpreter that's what we would that's what we would use for for interpretation so we we don't limit this uh based on language yeah it was just more of a comment around the rockwood clinical frailty scale and just it's such an intuitive scale that i can see why it makes sense to use it because we can get that picture in and within our renal department whenever we talk about introducing that scale, the conversation automatically goes towards scales that are more precise, but more clinically complex. And what that means is here we are four years later and we're still not using anything. So I think, yeah, the use of that scale, you know, more consistently is more effective than some super complex, precise tool that nobody uses. I agree, uh, I, you know, I 100% agree. And so that's one of the nice things about a quality improvement approach, right? Is that, you know, you walk up to someone, you say, let's just try this for a month and see what you think. And if you don't like it, we can do something different, right? And what you find is a month later, they're like, oh, this is pretty easy. It gives me more information than I had before. So, okay. Or I really hate it, but I really hate it for these reasons. And now I'm motivated to fix it. Um, mm -hmm. So like, I think that's, framing this as a quality improvement project help us helped us with all of that and we were very open to feedback i just say so what are the general responses that you're hearing so far from patients in terms of like the overall experience this is something they're glad that they engaged in and yeah it's often difficult to from the preliminary data it's difficult to um uh, tease apart the oh, the the rehab piece from the, just the getting better and out of ICU piece. Yeah. Um, so people obviously are gratified that they were able to get out of the ICU. Um, I think as we got better with our communication, so the 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 data that I have, the best data I have is with the first patient, and so she only got like a month or something of the rehab scale after being with us for like seven months. So she was pretty clear she that that like it was really helpful for her um that being able to anticipate stuff so it's my hope that we'll be able to to draw on that um because that's that's always been my impression is that you know if i was in the bed and i know something i'm gonna have to do some hard work today but i don't know exactly what that's going to look like and it looks different every day like i think get anxiety just thinking about that and so i think that and this person dealt with a lot of anxiety and so, you know, down the road, maybe my research study down the road is going to be anxiety scores and rehab planning. I don't know. Yeah. Lots of ways to go with that. Great. With patients and staff. Yeah. What, time, yeah, right? <laughs> what, am, I, what am I doing today? What am I coordinating today? And yeah. do I want to wait till 11 o'clock to find out or? Yeah. 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 Great. Thanks for your interest, guys. I really appreciate it. Well, we so appreciate uh, your sharing this amazing quality improvement, soon to be research uh, <laughs> project. And um, I think all of us uh, can look at parallels to how we can also utilize um, your approach. And I love the way that you um, showed your uh, data in the spider charts. I, I think that, that that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you for joining us. If you would like to learn more about our association, please visit our website at www.cnsabc.ca or follow us on Twitter at CNSABC.